So chapter 14 was quite a sad chapter in War Horse. Um, we're going to read chapter 15 now and see what happens next. I stood by Topthorn and Frederick all that day and into the night, leaving them only once to drink briefly at the river. The shelling moved back and forth along the valley, showering grass and earth and trees into the air and leaving behind great craters that smoked as if the earth itself was on fire. But any fear I might have had was overwhelmed by a powerful sense of sadness and love that compelled me to stay with Topthorn for as long as I could. I knew that once I left him, I would be alone in the world again, that I would no longer have his strength and support beside me. So I stayed with him and waited. I remember it was near first light and I was cropping the grass close to where they lay when I heard through the crump and whistle of the shells the whining sound of motors accompanied by a terrifying rattle of steel that set my ears back against my head. It came from over the ridge from the direction in which the soldiers had disappeared, a grating, roaring sound that came even nearer by the minute and louder again as the shelling died away completely. Although at the time I did not know it as such, the first tank I ever saw came over the rise of the hill with the cold light of dawn behind it. It was a great grey lumbering monster that belched out smoke from behind as it rocked down the hillside towards me. I hesitated only for a few moments before blind terror tore me at last from Topthorn's side and sent me bolting down the hill towards the river. I crashed into the river without even knowing whether I should find my feet or not and was halfway up the wooded hill on the other side before I dared stop and turn to see if it was still chasing me. I should never have looked, for the one monster had become several monsters, and they were rolling down towards me, already past the place where Topthorn lay with Frederick on the shattered hillside. I waited, secure, I thought, in the shelter of trees and watched the tanks ford the river before turning once more to run. I ran, I knew not where. I ran till I could no longer hear that dreadful rattle and until the gun seemed far away. I remember crossing a river again, galloping through empty farmyards, jumping fences and ditches and abandoned trenches and clattering through deserted ruined villages before I found myself grazing that evening in a lush, wet meadow and drinking from a clear pebbly brook. And then exhaustion finally overtook me. It sapped my strength from my legs and it forced me to lie down and sleep. When I woke up, it was dark and the guns were firing once more all around me. No matter where I looked, it seemed, the sky was lit with the yellow flashes of gunfire and intermittent white glowing lights that pained my eyes and showered daylight briefly onto the countryside around me. Whichever way I went, it seemed it had to be towards the guns. Better, therefore, I thought, to stay where I was. Here at least I had grass, a plenty, and water to drink. I had made up my mind to do just that when there was an explosion of white light above my head and the rattle of a machine gun split the night air, the bullets whipping into the ground beside me. I ran again and kept running into the night, stumbling frequently in the ditches and hedges until the fields lost their grass and the trees were mere stumps against the flashing skyline. Wherever I went now, there were great craters in the ground filled with murky, stagnant water. It was as I staggered out of one such crater that I lumbered into an invisible coil of barbed wire that first snagged and then trapped my foreleg. As I kicked out widely to free myself, I felt the barbs tearing into my foreleg before I broke clear. From then on, I could manage only to limp on slowly into the night, feeling my way forward. Even so, I must have walked for miles. But where to and where from, I shall never know. All the while my leg pulsated with pain, and on every side of me the great guns were sounding out and rifle fire spat into the night. Bleeding, bruised, terrified beyond belief, I longed only to be with Topthorn again. He would know which way to go. He would know. I stumbled on into the night, guided only by the belief that there were that where the night was at its blackest, there alone I might find safety from the shelling. Behind me, the thunder and lightning of the bombardment was so terrible in its intensity, turning the deep black of night into unnatural day, that I could not contemplate going back, even though I knew that it was in the direction that Topthorn lay. 
there was some gunfire ahead of me and on both sides of me but i could see away in the distance a black horizon of undisturbed night and so i moved on steadily towards it my wounded leg was stiffening stiffening up all the time in the cold of the night and it pained me now even to lift it very soon i found i could put no weight on it at all this was to be the longest night of my life a nightmare of agony terror and loneliness i suppose it was only a strong instinct to survive that compelled me to walk on and kept me on my feet all day i sensed that my only chance laying in putting the noise of the battle as far behind me as possible was to keep moving from time to time rifle fire and machine gun fire would crackle all around me and i would stand paralyzed with fear terrified to move in any direction until the firing stopped and i found my muscles could move once more to begin with i found the mists hovering only in the depths of the crater i passed but after some hours i find myself increasingly surrounded in a thick smoky mist through which i could see only the vague shades and shapes of dark and light around me almost blinded now i relied totally on the ever more distant roar and the rumble of the bombardment keeping it all the time behind me and moving towards the darker more silent world ahead of me dawn was already brightening the gloom of the mist when i heard the sound of hushed urgent voices ahead of me i stood quite still and listened straining my eyes to find the people to whom they belonged stand to get a move on get a move on lads the voices were muffled in the mist there was a sound of rushing feet and clattering rifles pick it up lad pick it up what do you think you're about now clean that rifle off and do it sharpish a long silence followed and i moved gingerly towards the voices both tempted and terrified at the same time there it is again sarge i saw something honest i did what was it then son the whole german ruddy army or just one or two of them out for a morning stroll it weren't a man sarge nor even a german neither looked more like an horse or a cow to me a cow or a horse out there in no man's land and how the blazes do you think it got there son you've been staying up too late your eyes is playing tricks on you i heard it too sarge and all honest sarge cross me heart well i can't see nothing i can't see nothing son and that's cause there's nothing there you're all of a jitter son and your jittering has brought the old ready battalion on standing too half an hour early and who's going to be a popular little lad when i tells the lieutenant all about it spoiled his beauty sleep haven't you son you're gone and woken up all them lovely captains and majors and brigaders and all of them nice sergeants and all just cause you thought you seen a flaming horse and then in a louder voice that was intended to carry further but seeing as our we're all stood to and there's a pea soup flaming london smog out there and seeing as our jerry likes to come and knock in on our little dugouts just when we can't see him a coming i want you lads to keep your eyes peeled back and wide open then we'll all live to eat our breakfasts if it's on this morning that'll be a rum ration coming round in a few minutes that'll lighten you up but until then i want every one of your eyes skinned as he spoke i limped away i could feel myself shaken from head to tail in dreadful anticipation of the next bullet or shell and i wanted only to be alone away from any noise whatever whether or not it appeared to be threatening in my weakened frightened condition any sense of reason had left me and i wandered now through the mists until my good legs could drag me no further i stood at last resting my bleeding leg on a soft fresh mound of mud beside a foul-smelling water-filled crater and i snuffled the ground in vain for something to eat but the earth where i stood was bare of grass and i had neither the energy nor the will at that moment to move another step forward i lifted my head again to look about me in case i should discover any grass nearby and as i did so i felt the first sunlight filter in through the mist and touch my back sending gentle shivers of warmth through my cold cramped body within minutes the mist began to clear away and i saw for the first time that i stood in a wide corridor of mud a wasted shattered landscape between two vast unending rolls of barbed wire that stretched away into the distance behind me and in front of me 
I remembered I had been in such a place once before, that day when I had charged a closet with Topthorn beside me. This was what the soldiers had called no man's land.